Hello everyone and welcome to a Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport. I'm Ed Foster and I'm joined by regular Motorsport contributor James Mills and two very special guests on my left. We've got Chief Creator, Creative Officer Marek Reichman and Director Q and Special Project Sales Simon Lane. It's quite a mouthful. Just for everyone listening, just give us a little bit of insight into what you do because it's an amazing job you have. Uh, yeah, it's quite a long title, isn't it? Uh, that it really reflects the fact that there are two pillars to the role that I have. Um, one is to uh, oversee Q, which is Aston Martin's uh, bespoke commissioning service. And so that's uh, um, a service whereby customers can walk into any dealership in the world and commission a bespoke car. And equally, dealers can also do that. Um, and then Q also uh, uh, creates its own limited edition cars, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, the other pillar is around special project sales. Um, so special projects, what does that mean in our language? That means really anything that is not a series production car. So uh, I'll give you some examples, Valkyrie, Valhalla, um, the continuation cars, those are all special projects. And so my team are responsible for the customer liaison sales and delivery of those cars. Amazing. Now we are in the club on Pall Mall and downstairs in the rotunda, there's a very special DBS 59. Marek, tell us a little bit about this car because it's the 60th anniversary of that amazing year in 59. Uh, it's obviously got a link to that. Yeah, the, the car, again, this is one of the specials that uh, Simon was responsible for. Um, 24 cars were created, uh, created to celebrate 59 and the great win. An amazing experience and package around the car. Obviously, the car itself, um, a specific color, specific interior detailing, exterior detailing, inlays. Um, you have race helmets in the back of the car. There are murals on the leather, actually printed onto the leather inside the car as well. Various details on the inside of the car, on the interior components, the switch gear, uh, real real woods, etc., etc. So you can imagine the makeup of the car, but it's not just about that. It's the whole experience. So the 24 cars were handed over at Le Mans. All of the, all of the owners met in a, in a chateau. They were presented their cars on the start finish line at Le Mans. They got to do the Le Mans start, run to their cars, do a lap of the circuit. They got to follow someone in a DBR1 around the circuit just before the race started. So it's- Follow you know, someone your, yourself. It, it was <laughs> myself, yeah, which for me was, was uh, you know, boyhood dream. Imagine driving a DBR1 at Le Mans um, with full grandstands, uh, honestly. Um, just amazing and yeah that was the special occasion and the great thing is that that group of people have stayed in contact they really enjoy their own their, the company and they they are doing things together with their cars and we had two owners there um, last night at, at the talk we gave amazing I, <clears throat> I have to say when I bought my BMW 320d I did not get to go to Le Mans um, the uh, this special projects and queue by Aston Martin just so I'm just tell me a little bit about what this, how much of a business is this? And wh how did it come about? Because, um, you know, and people who are into cars know about it, but the average guy on the street, I suppose for good reason, they, they aren't going to walk into a dealership and order one of these things. But how and when did this all start? Um, well, it started uh, in my, my previous life was as a dealer principal at Aston Martin Cambridge, um, which is a, a relatively small Aston Martin dealership in East Anglia. And uh, I started there uh, at the end of 2013, and um, I had had an idea around dovetailing a, a really fun experience in with a limited edition. And I met uh, a group of um, former Red Arrows pilots uh, called the Blades, and uh, went to one of their corporate days. And they th they are so well organised. They do these fantastic corporate days where you go up and fly with them. They're, they're, they're actually licensed as an airline, would you believe it? So you can go and fly with these guys and you're about 12 feet apart, upside down doing loop the loop with three other people. And uh, uh, they, they just put on a very, very uh, slick event. And um, talking to the team owner, he said, yeah, I'm gonna be 50 next year and I, th I think I'd really like to have an Aston Martin. And I said, well, I think using Q, we could make a car that has the livery from your aircraft on the car. Would you be interested in that? Yes, I would be. So one thing led to another, and I started to think, why don't we build five of these? We'll pair them with the team's aircraft, and we'll dovetail 
one of these um, luxury corporate days in so the, the customers can come and pick their car up from the airfield. They can fly with the team, with their family. They can have a really fun day and then drive their cars away at the end. So that's what we did and that's where we started. So that project was in 2015. And, and since then, there's, there's also been the Red Arrows Special Edition and the Spitfire. Well. Yeah, the Spitfire came next. Um, we, we, we hadn't even delivered the Blade project. Um, we were a few months away from delivering it and we'd sold all the cars and various people were saying to me, you know, how are you going to follow this up? It's been really, really successful and, and to be honest, it had been really fun. Um, and uh, I, I had become aware that 2016 was the 80th anniversary of the first flight of the Spitfire. And we were located four miles away from the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, which is the home of the Spitfire, really. It's the, the where the first Spitfire squadron was based. And uh, so I approached them and said, you know, would you be interested in working with us to create uh, a, a car to mark the 80th anniversary of the Spitfire? And uh, they came on board in spades. Um, in fact, the aircraft restoration company at Duxford helped us manufacture parts for the cars. So there, there are three Spitfire parts in, in those cars. And we handed them all over inside the uh, museum at Duxford. Um, the uh, the RAF Benevolent Fund attended that event because we donated some money out of the project. I felt very strongly that we needed to give something back to the men and women that had flown those aircraft. So they came to the day to accept a, uh, a giant check that we'd had made. And they brought with them uh, a chap called Squadron Leader Alan Scott, who's a Battle of Britain veteran Spitfire pilot. And he stood up at the front of this hangar and you, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, he, he, he talked about learning to fly Spitfires when he was 18, going into combat after only 10 hours on Spitfires, um, shooting down his first aircraft over Margate and then going off into the Battle of Malta. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, and obviously we had Spitfires in the hangars and then the customers went off and they all had a flight in, in the back of a two-seat Spitfire on the day they collected their car. And at the end of the day, we moved the cars out onto the runway and uh, one of only, only two surviving um, airworthy Mark I Spitfires um, flew over these cars at 35 feet at 300 miles an hour with the owners standing a couple hundred yards off the runway. It was quite a moment um, and then did a big display. So yeah, it was a, it was a great event and um, we filmed this event. I, I, I chartered a helicopter as part of the, the whole uh, package which, um, which flew alongside the Spitfires and got lots of great aerial footage. And we made a two minute film which went on to Aston Martin's social media and it went on and broke on Facebook, it broke every record for any film we'd ever put up because it was just so, it was such a cool story. And, you know, V12 Aston Martins and a V12 Spitfire flying around. Um, so I think it was watched 700,000 times in the first week. Um, and it's now sitting about a million views. So, um, yeah, it was a great project, a lot of fun. And uh, at the end of the day, at the end of that day, the RF Benevolent Fund said, you know, this has been just such a great journey and we've really enjoyed it. Would you not consider doing something with the Royal Air Force itself? And I said, I'd love to, but I had no idea how to, you know, how do I get into Whitehall and the MOD and who to speak to and I'd need some very high level support. And they said, you know, we'd, we'd be really willing to, to help you do that. So to do something with the Red Arrows normally, if you want to make some teacups or some T-shirts, the, uh, the, the, there's a, a levy or a royalty that you need to pay in order to put their branding on anything, the same as it would be with any other organisation, which is about 10% of the RRP. So you can imagine on a Vanquish, that would be not doable. Uh, so I had to think of another way of making it worth the RAF and the MOD's uh, time working with us on this project. So I came up with the idea of, well, instead of trying to pay them money, why don't we try and absorb a car into this project and then gift it to them free of charge, and then they could raffle it, and that would allow any man in the street to end up owning it, and they would therefore be able to raise a lot more money than the cash value of the car. And so that's what we did. Um, they raffled the car off um, over six months um, and they raised uh, 1.5 million pounds. Amazing. And that gave us access to the Red Arrows, frankly. So Incredible. Yeah. Marika, sort of a two-pronged question for you. Um, Aston Martin has never been a mass producer of cars. Um, but this, you know, more and more we're seeing this from lo lots of manufacturers, kind of very limited edition um, creations. Is this where the future lies? And also, there's been many kind of special editions uh, and limited edition cars that haven't. They're actually very difficult to make money on because of the amount of attention to detail that goes to them. So, first of all, is this the future? And is there actually money to be made as a car manufacturer with these Q and special edition models? Yeah, it is absolutely the future, and I think we are more attuned now to personalisation, even down to the fact that the the iPhone is 11 years old. 
before the iPhone, you didn't oh, feel so old. <laughs> yeah, you, you, but you didn't carry around a photo, your your own favorite photograph. So now you personalize even the phone that you use every single day is personalized to you because it carries your photograph, the one you want to see. So I think personalization is a really important part of any product into the future and, and what the consumer wants. Wanting to have something very personalized and pertinent to yourself is so important. In f I go back to mass manufacturing or how many cars. So we're 106 years old and in 106 years we've built around circa 85 to 90,000 cars in 106 years. So that's how limited the production is. Last year was around six and a half thousand. Just to put that into context, Toyota would take two days to make 90,000 cars. It took us 106 years. So yes, it is very bespoke by its nature and it's around 200 man hours to build a standard product, DB11 or a DBS. It's about 2,000 hours to build one of the specials in terms of man hours at physically building the car. So it gives you an idea of if you get to a special product, then the, the, the amount of time it takes to build it increases. And obviously the complexity increases then when you're doing something special. And we talked a little bit last night about the standard process for ordering your car is about 12 weeks because we've already defined the color schemes, we've defined the color of the leather, the color of the switch gear, et cetera, et cetera, the car's makeup. If you then say, well, I want a unique color, it takes longer than the 12 weeks because you have to specifically dye a hide. You may have to laser cut a hide. That's just one element within the car. So that whole process of personalization, it, of course, it extends time, but the customer and the consumer is waiting for something very, very unique and very special. And they're going on a journey. So we'll bring them on the journey. They'll come into the dealership. If, if it's part of one of Simon's programs, then you're very involved in the whole makeup an early presentation, potentially a dinner, present what the idea is going to be. And then you come on the journey of, well, when do I get it? When do I first see a part? You can have a webcam watching your car being built online. You can have a build book. You can come to the factory and see your car coming out of, out of the tub shop and onto the paint line, et cetera, et cetera. So you can really, and you can go to the factory and point to your car. That's my car. There it is. And, and a lot of our customers do that because it's not just about the product, it's the experience of being involved. And then if it's just your own, so it's not 24 of, it's a one-off, you're sitting there with the design team actually saying, no, I want this color and I want that stitch and I want it in this position. And then you have an advisor who'd say, well, I, you know, you can kind of do don't, this. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, it's, it's incredibly complex. There are over a million potential combinations, if you think about all the parts inside the car, different sizes of stitch, different color of stitch, different leathers, different carbons, different woods, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can actually get it very wrong. And some people come in with an idea of, of something they, they want, they want to create something. And my, my job and my, my team's job is to say, why do you want this and what expression? What do you want to say about the product and, and you? And then help them with a kind of, oh, I understand you want it to be um, incredibly uh, overt or you want it to be very subtle or you want it to really have a personal message. And what's the personal message to you? There is another level altogether, isn't there, which is Q commission where I've read that um, cars can cost from a minimum of a million pounds. How many man hours would you say would go into something like that or do you not even want to contemplate that? I, I mean, yeah, Simon may know from, from actually looking at the data of how much time we spend on it, but it's, it, yeah, it's an unbelievable amount of time. You, basically, we have two slots per year to build one-off cars and that's not just color and materials, that's physical bodies. So we can do a, a one-off car. Um, cars that you would know, uh, CC100 as a for instance, that celebrated our centenary. We built two cars based on the VH2 Vantage platform, so the last generation Vantage. Only two were made, special unique bodies, both with collectors now. One collector uses his car far more than the other. The other one doesn't really use the car at, at all, um, but that car's been up the hill at Goodwood, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's a well-known one-off. And, and uh, we have a, a another couple of commissions that the customer 
may decide to show or may not decide to show as well. So some of these one-offs are unique and private to the customer, and it's their choice whether they decide that the world should see them or not. Which then p- potentially puts you in a, a, a delicate situation, shall we say, because you may have someone come to you and say, I've seen the GT12 Roadster. I'd like one of those. But that is a one-of-a-kind vehicle. So how do you handle that conversation? I, I pass it over to Simon. <laughs> <laughs> There's a phrase about something rolling downhill, and I, don't know, I can't quite remember it. Um, but. The, 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 the agreements on these cars are as unique as the cars. So it depends on the, on the situation, on whether we have guaranteed exclusivity on that particular car or whether we have said we'll do it, but we will, we will then allow other people to buy the same thing. And sometimes we do do that. Um, and, and we can always go back to the customer, to the client, and say, look, you've created a car, everybody loves it, five other people want one, what do you think? You know, and it's their choice at the end of the day. I suppose actually that will probably do no harm to the value of their car. Yeah. No, absolutely not. And, and it's not just specific bodies or interiors, it can be down to a colour. We have Valkyrie customers who have specified a colour and created a colour that they've said no one else is allowed to use this colour and they've named the colour and they've said that's my colour and we have paperwork that says okay we'll never replicate it other than on one of your cars etc etc. Amazing, mentioning the the Valkyrie there, uh, it's obviously in conjunction with Adrian Newey and, and Red Bull, how did that come about and was that part of the kind of Formula One talks or and what's it been like to work with Adrian? Yeah, I mean, it, it came about because of we have uh, a product plan that we call the second century. So I mentioned being 106 years old. We have a plan because we intend to, to be 212 years old, so another 106 years. So we call it the second century, and it's about the diversification of the product portfolio. You, you would know Aston Martin for a front mid-engine 2C car or 2 plus 2 typical GT car incredible to drive but great to go on a long GT journey. You wouldn't know Aston Martin for an SUV and you wouldn't know Aston Martin for a mid-engine car. The mid-engine car is car number five in our plan which comes after the DBX. DBX launches this year, um, in a few weeks in fact. To get to the mid-engine car we felt we needed to come from a position of of being at the truly at the top of the triangle and and what is the most incredible mid-engine product, it's an F1 car. So when Andy Palmer joined the business, his old relationship with Christian Horner and Red Bull Racing came back to, to the fray. Adrian wanted to create a road car. We wanted to create a future non-specific series road car. So our competitor to a McLaren 720 or a Ferrari, etc., etc. The idea was then, how do we create the halo? So let's create the world's greatest mid-engine car, which is Valkyrie. Effectively, Formula One technology and Aston Martin's build and knowledge of making a road car, because it's not an easy job to put an F1 car onto the road and make it legal. And that's effectively what, what Valkyrie is. So we have 150 units that provide the halo that then spins down into the non-series or the, the full production car of, of Vanquish Concept in a few years' time. And uh, all those units, are they sold? All 150 Valkyries are sold, plus a huge list of people still wanting to, to get, get, on the, get on the list if someone drops out. I think we had um, 600 applicants for 150 cars. Um, obviously 150 sold and fully deposited with around 50 people fully deposited waiting to get onto the list. We, we still get inquiries every week for Valkyrie. Um, and uh, I think I should point out that every Valkyrie is a Q car. So we've now completed almost all 150 specs and every car is bespoke, every car is different. So, yes, yeah, so no, no two cars are the same. No two, no two cars are the same and they have all gone via Q because they all have bespoke paintwork, bespoke graphics. Um, and uh, we've had uh, a member of uh, Marek's team present in every session, in fact a couple of members of Marek's team, because we've had not only a, a colour and trim designer but also a CAD artist there to carry out an absolutely bespoke specification session and it's amazing watching the CAD artist bring the customer's vision to life on screen uh, uh, in front of them and so that's been a really interesting process um, flying customers in from all around the world to come and spec their cars and um, 
we we've surveyed the customers now to see how the experience was and i've been really 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 pleased with the feedback because to be honest we didn't we didn't benchmark we didn't know what was it like specking a mclaren p1 what was it like specking a laferrari well the feedback that we've had from the customers has been universally actually the way that we've done it has been far by far the most enjoyable experience and we've offered far more personalization yeah it's, it's quite an intense day actually because the customers typically arrive it's a it's a it's either a full day or a couple of half days um, because you really have when you start to see the complexity of the car itself and you put on your VR goggles and you can sit in the car and wander around the car and see how many items you can actually change. Even on the interior, which is a full carbon tub, and you're seated and um, basically you're fixed to the tub um, and everything else adjusts to you. But So you'd think it would be quite simple because you're just sitting in a carbon tub, but there are a myriad ways to A, weave the carbon, think about the carbon, trim, trim, over trim, disguise, etc. anything on the inside, and then the complexity of the outside. So I, I normally join, if it's in the morning, come say hi, what do you want to do, and then come check their homework at the end of the day. Do you think a similar approach will filter down to the Valhalla and to the Vanquish Vision concept, whatever that will be called ultimately? Is it, is it, will it be that detailed, or will it be a slightly different so Val- Valhalla, the, the numbers are, are higher, so we, we're building 500 Valhalla, but we still expect the uptake on Q to be very high. And so we're looking at how we're going to manage that process at the moment around the world. Um, it's a slightly different delivery arrangement in that Valhalla is a dealer-supplied car, whereas all the 150 Valkyries are a direct uh, sale contract with the factory. Um, so we need to find ways of making it easier than having to fly from Australia to the UK to spec your car. Um, so uh, that, that's something we're looking into at the moment. Obviously, but Aston Martin, I, I think of as a, as a small kind of bespoke manufacturer. Are you, you've got the rep, uh, electric repeat, and I bumped into Darren at the Festival of Speed, who's been driving it all weekend, who loved it. Are you worried about the next 10, 20 years in the sense that when I think of Aston Martin, I think of V12s, V8s, lovely noise, and that's for me, what Aston Martin is all about, beautiful cars. The, the motoring industry is moving away from that. Um, you've got the electric repeat, but it's going to totally change what you guys do, more so, I think, than, than a company that produces city cars. I think, you know, we talk about for the love of beautiful. So beautiful is always going to be part of our mantra, whether it's electric-driven, hybrid-driven, or a V6, it, it has to be about beauty. And, you know, Valkyrie is an extreme example. It's probably going to be the last naturally aspirated V12 engine ever produced, I would imagine. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, as you just mentioned, we've got the Rapid EV, and the Rapid E, which is a full BEV car. It's beautiful. So in, in many ways, we're not agnostic to the powertrain, but Beauty has to be the first principle, and an Aston Martin will always be beautiful. In many respects, battery electric vehicles give you a, a, a different opportunity in terms of the visualization of beauty and how, how you look at something, because you're not constrained by the size or the mass of a V12, a V8, or a V6. You ha- the, the batteries sit within the floor, if you like, so you have more freedom in many ways to represent the, the profile of the pr- of the car so for me it's it's an opportunity um, we'll always have beautiful cars and I, and I would always say that if you see rapid e moving it's actually quite incredible because it doesn't have a sound you do get the sound of air the aero around the car moving and as a dynamic car to be in especially with dt driving it's it's quite spectacular but every single one of his passengers could have got out with wobbly legs at the top of the hill. Uh, absolutely. Well, the, p- the power delivery, because going through a corner, you just you can use all the torque that the battery electric vehicle has. So you're not constrained by the delivery of that. It's instantaneous, and it just keeps coming. And so if, if you're a driver of his capability, you can really put the car through its paces. I'd, I'd be meaning to ask something that, you know, ever, ever since I sort of met you, there are very few jobs in the world that carry the weight of the head designer at Porsche for its 911, and I would say Aston Martin, as the, you know, is such a, such a big role to step into. Were you apprehensive when you started 
started last week. I don't think I slept for a month. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> and no, I was uh, un- unbelievably excited. And, and of course, yeah, it's a, a huge opportunity. A lot to lose um, as well. But I've, I've been uh, 15 years with the business now and um, had quite some quite incredible opportunities and, and cars, you know, creating 177. I think I'm on my, I've lost count, I think I'm on my fourth Bond car. You know, and, and and even that, which is which is the fun side of what we do. You know, working with James Bond, working with Eon, it, it, it's it's a huge um, benefit to our business. But it's fun as well. It, it, in many ways, it represents who we are because we are a very serious bespoke manufacturer. But we also like to smile every single day, and we we, we want people to smile when they see our cars. We want people to put their thumbs up, and that's the reaction that we get from our product now. So yes, huge pressure, but it's, you know, it's why I get out of bed. I, I love what I do. I love the people I work with. I love the brand, you know, the, the ethos behind the brand and the passion that we have to carry on providing cars into the future, whether they're BEVs, V6s, naturally aspirated V12s that simply make people smile. I mean, we're talking about such a major transformation for Aston, seven new vehicles, seven years, etc. That takes so much uh, cash. You're burning through cash at the moment. So I'm curious to know if you can give us an indication uh, what contribution Q, the division of Q, makes to the, to the group. Uh, well, the short answer is not enough. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I'm here. <laughs> Excellent answer. Um, uh, so la- last year, Q, um, in terms of the, the mainstream production line in Gaiden, was responsible for touching 3% of the output. Um, so from my perspective, that's nowhere near enough. And I've written a plan now for us to grow that to 10% in five years' time, what we will be producing in five years' time. So bearing in mind we're bringing St. Athen on stream, we're going to have DBX um, and producing Q cars at uh, St. Athen is, uh, you know, a whole new world for our team. Um, but uh, the 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 the, the um, what drives me every day is I want to move Q to the centre of the company, and it hasn't been. It's been on the fringes, and uh, uh, you know w- what what we've shown with the projects and the the DBS fifty nine downstairs is there is a huge demand from customers for genuine bespoke cars that have a beautiful story around them and a luxury experience uh, attached. A money cannot buy experience, frankly, and that's what we've delivered with those previous projects. And so that's what I'm looking to do more of. Um, working from Aston Martin, Cambridge, I was really constrained to selling these cars into the UK market, and now I'm working from uh, HQ. There's an opportunity to deliver these kind of uh, experiences and projects on a global level. So expect to see a lot more output from Q. Something I uh, just wanted to ask, we're, we're nearing the end. The, if you spoke to someone 30 years ago and you said uh, there's going to be a Formula One team that's owned by a drinks company and sponsored by a car manufacturer, um, they would have thought you were completely mad. What does that, what, how does that work for you with, you know, obviously it's Red Bull powered by Honda with an Aston Martin badge on it. Um, do you, that, it obviously works for you, but I'm just wondering how and, and why. I, I mean, it works in the context of Valkyrie. So without Valkyrie, it doesn't work. And, and the reason we're there is because of that relationship with Red Bull Advanced Technologies and Valkyrie. Adrian Newey, if you like, is a it's a 50-50 relationship in terms of Adrian and myself, our teams, in developing Valkyrie. So it works from that context. But it's, it's also a great platform um, and exposure to the brand and you, you you have to talk to more people now as as you grow and you develop your portfolio when you're producing a product which is not typical of who you are a, a mid-engine car and an SUV you need to talk to more people about your product and it's a brilliant platform you know and, and why Red Bull I mean they're pretty good at what they do and you know yes it's a drinks manufacturer but the, the core and the principle of the team they're winners you know, and 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 even with a with a, if you, you could argue that it's an engine which is not the Ferrari or not the Mercedes engine, but they're still a winning car because the total combination of Honda, the chassis, Adrian Newey's knowledge gives you a, a perfect scenario to get a car which, on certain circuits, is is better than the rest. And I think that's what we gain from it. Of course, is the F1 knowledge. It's it's the spirit of teamwork. It's the desire to win. It's the understanding. You know, and they're based in Milton Keynes. So they're a, they're a, a British team in many respects. 
Simon, I was chatting to Marek before we started recording, and actually he's very kindly said that you could choose any cue car from history and take it home. Um, going to put you on the spot here. Uh, what, you know, you've done so many special editions and also individual cars. What is it that you take? Uh, well, I, I, I don't need to think about it. I'd love to own one of the Spitfire cars. Um, we you know, poured a lot of uh, love and passion into that. The, the Spitfire is such a an iconic aircraft and such a beautiful shape and the, and the history uh, behind it. And uh, we put some really, really cool details in that car. I was talking about some of them last night, you know, the um, that we spent a day at uh, IWM pouring over a Mark 1 Spitfire, the same one actually that did the fly past. And, uh, and they, they were great. They let us sort of crawl all over the aircraft and I, I took a team of Q engineers and designers with me. And we lifted the engine cowling on on the uh, on the front of the aircraft, and there was a brass p- plaque, a rectangular brass plaque, with the firing order of the V12 engine on it. And that was one of the things I loved about this project: is that we had a V12, and the Spitfire had a V12, and and comparing the sound of them because they both make an incredible noise. So um, I asked the aircraft restoration company, "Could you make that plaque, but put the firing order of our V12 is actually different? So could we could you recreate it?" And they did, and they mounted it on a. Uh, a plaque uh, 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 inside the glove box of the car. So it's a, a really nice detail. But um, yeah, there's there seven out of the eight of them are the seven-speed dogleg manual, which we only made for a very short time. I mean, there's probably a cu- couple of hundred cars in the UK, and eight of them are the, the Spitfire car, and they they have the most beautiful colour and trim combination, and all the detailing inside them. So yeah, I would love to own one of those at some point. I just need to rob a bank. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wonderful to chat to two people who are so involved in the car industry who, well, one learned to drive in a, tri- in a um, Triumph TR4 and the other in a Sprite. Um, it's fantastic to know that there are real enthusiasts at the heart of these companies. Um, and wonderfully, the future looks bright for Aston Martin, I think, obviously, you know, talking yeah, to absolutely. you guys. Um, you know, you're not going to come in here and be pessimistic, but, it, you know, you, c- you can tell that it's, it's looking bright. I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap it up there. Um, you've got some cue cars to go and make and sell. Marek, thank you so much for joining us. Simon, thank you. And James, thank you very much for joining me. We'll be back in a matter of weeks when London Motor Week starts. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.